Hey, my name's Matt Kennedy, and this is the Steadfast Podcast. This podcast exists to use Bible study and theological teaching to encourage you to be steadfast in your faith. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the Steadfast Podcast. I hope today's episode is an encouragement to you. In the first Theology Explainer episode, I covered baptism. Today we're going to talk about communion, which is also known as the Lord's Supper. Both baptism and communion are known to Protestants, which we'll cover in a minute, as ordinances. Ordinances are acts of obedience for the believer in Christ. They are things that Jesus himself started. They give us a picture of our gospel message. They are acts of obedience that reflect the grace that has been lavished upon us. Both baptism gives us that picture and communion does as well. Like baptism, communion, or the Lord's Supper, carries a lot of different interpretations. So there are four main views to how people approach this. And these views are really going to go at the nuts and bolts of how communion works and what it means. So I'm going to relatively quickly move through those four main views. And then what we'll attempt to do is to give you a biblical background for what led up to communion. And hopefully you'll see the significance that communion has in the meta-narrative of Scripture, or the grand story that Scripture gives us. And it's a truly a beautiful thing. So let's start with these four main views. All right, the first view is the Catholic view. It is called transubstantiation. Now, I know that's a weird sounding word, so let's break it apart. So in our culture, in our world, you're going to probably understand that the word trans means to change. The word substantiation is a word that we get from the word substance. So transubstantiation is a change of substance. So they believe that the bread and the wine changes in essence to the body and blood of Jesus. So when Jesus said, this is my body or this is my blood, they take him to be speaking literally. Now, please understand, Jesus often spoke in symbolic ways to communicate his identity and the things that he was accomplishing for us. For example, in the book of John, we have a whole bunch. We have seven I am statements, right? Statements like where he said, I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the gate. Jesus is not literally a loaf of bread. He is not literally a vine. He is not literally a gate. But each of those things symbolically reflect who he is and the work that he does. Now, to a Catholic, they're going to look at communion and say, hey, this transubstantiation, this change in substance that is occurring is an exception. So that's transubstantiation. The next three views are going to be Protestant views. And now, really quickly, what I want to to say about this is that in the 1500s, there was this really significant event called the Protestant Reformation. There were these groups of Christians who were protesting the doctrines of the Catholic Church. So they had their Bible in one hand and their Catholic theology in the other, and they were looking at what Scripture said, and they were looking at what the Catholic Church was teaching. And they're saying, hey, these things are not adding up. There are errors all over the place. We need to reform this to get back to Scripture, sola scriptura. As this was happening, there were all of these ideas on how to interpret things like communion, among so many other topics, right? This is not their only topic. There are many topics that they had issue with. But today's episode is on communion. So let's look at the three views, three main views, I should say, that came out of the Protestant Reformation. The first Protestant view is consubstantiation. So this was Martin Luther's idea. The word con means with. So remember, substantiation means substance. So the idea is that the body and blood of Jesus exist with the bread and wine. If you go and read further on this, what you're going to find a lot is the words in, with, and under associated with this view. So they're saying the body of Christ is in, with, and under the bread. They're saying the blood of Christ is in, with, and under the wine. The analogy that is often put with this view is that of a sponge. So sponge can absorb water, right? So the sponge and water are not the same thing. They are with one another. They may be in one another, under one another, but they are not the same thing. Really what the view of consubstantiation comes down to is that it feels like Luther really wanted to take the words of Jesus as literal in some way while creating space between his view and the Catholic view. 
A second member of the Protestant Reformation was this guy named John Calvin, and his view was a spiritual presence view. He was not a fan of Martin Luther's thinking on the matter. He did not think that this needed to be interpreted literally. Instead, he says that Christ is spiritually present with the believer when they take communion in a, a special way. So I've seen Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 cited to support this view. And it says, quote, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. End quote. So the passage that that verse is in is not actually about communion. It's about church discipline, it's about prayer, but not communion. I would say Jesus being God, we know he is spiritually omnipresent. Yet, there does seem to be some special presence when believers are gathered together, like the words he just spoke there. And communion is an example of believers gathering together. But I think one would be hard-pressed to scripturally argue that Jesus is more spiritually present at a gathering of believers partaking in communion than he is during other gathering of believers. Still, that is John Calvin's spiritual presence view, and many Protestants all over the world hold that view. The last view that we got today is called the memorial view, and it comes from another member of the Protestant Reformation. He's a contemporary to Martin Luther and John Calvin, and that's this guy named Ulrich Zwingli. He says taking communion is an act of remembrance, a memorial to the Lord, to remember what Christ has done and accomplished for us. For my Baptist friends, this is the typical Baptist view. The emphasis that Zwingli would put is not, this is my body, but rather, do this in remembrance of me. Since the last three views were written by members of the Protestant Reformation, you're talking about views that started around 500 years ago. The Catholic view of transubstantiation was coined about 800 years ago. So you might be wondering, what did the early church believe? Now, I'm not an expert in patristics, but I have been able to find a number of quotes from early church fathers that seem to support all the views, except for consubstantiation. Sorry, Martin Luther, but that one doesn't seem to be evident in the early church. Maybe it was there and I just couldn't find it, but I saw quotes from people who seem to support transubstantiation, spiritual presence, memorial view, but just no consubstantiation. It doesn't appear that there was just one view then. It seemed like there were people that maybe disagreed on the nuts and bolts of what was going on. But I will say that it seems to me the early church was primarily concerned with the condition of the heart approaching the communion table than they were about the nuts and bolts of what was going on. Personally, I hold to the memorial view. For me, the main reason to hold the memorial view is for how it fits in the narrative of Scripture. As well with the words of Jesus when he established communion and said, Do this in remembrance of me. Now, let me explain what I mean by it fitting into the narrative of Scripture. First, let us look at the setting of when Jesus established communion. We're going to find that in Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. Quote, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go. And prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. End quote. So Jesus sends Peter and John ahead of the rest of the group to prepare the Passover meal for them. He's not calling it communion or Lord's Supper right there. The thing that is going to be established as communion, that's going to be established as the Lord's Supper, is the Passover meal. So to understand what communion is, you have to understand the Passover. You have to go back to the book of Exodus when it was established. Now when Exodus opens up, God's people, the people of Israel, they are multiplying in the kingdom of Egypt. They're everywhere. And the new king of Egypt, he doesn't know who they are. He is not having it. He doesn't want all of these people all over the place that are not Egyptian. Actually, he was afraid that if Egypt went to war against someone, the Israelites might try to help their enemies. So this new king of Egypt, he decides he is going to enslave the Israelites. Let's look at Exodus chapter 1, verses 11 through 14. Quote, Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pythom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. End quote. 
The passage goes on to say that the king of Egypt started instructing midwives that if any of the people of Israel had a boy, the boy was to die. Now, when they refused to do this, because decent people would refuse that command, he commanded that all Israelite boys were to be thrown into the Nile River. These are the conditions God's people, the people of Israel, were living in. They were heartbroken and oppressed slaves, and they had no power, no ability to do anything about it. They were totally helpless. So God tells this guy named Moses that he has heard the cries of his people and that he is going to deliver them out of slavery, out of captivity. Really what we see here is God declaring war on this superpower Egypt. He turns the Nile to blood. He sends frogs and gnats and flies. He brings a plague on the Egyptian livestock. He brings boils and locusts and hell. He brings three days of pitch black darkness. And these weren't random plagues either. God wasn't just spinning some kind of weird wheel in heaven saying, ooh, looks like it's going to be gnats today. No, each one showed God's power over a perceived Egyptian god. For example, there was this god named Happy, H-A-P-I, and he was supposed to be the god of the Nile. So what does God do to show his dominance over Happy? He turns the Nile to blood. Take that, Happy. Then there is one more plague. That is the plague of the death of the firstborn. God declared that every firstborn, from the son of Pharaoh to the child of a slave girl to the firstborn of the cattle out in the field, they would all die. This was God's judgment coming down hard on the land of Egypt. There was only one way for the people of Israel to be saved from this coming judgment. God was going to save them through what he was going to establish as the Passover. Now, God instructed his people to prepare for the Passover meal. They had to take an unblemished lamb, so this perfect lamb, and prepare it as the main course. As they were going through the preparation process, they were supposed to take some of the lamb's blood and mark the doorpost over their homes. So the blood of the lamb signaled that God's judgment would, listen to this, pass over that house. For their judgment was carried out on the lamb. So for generations and generations, lambs were killed year after year, every year at Passover, because they would carry the burden of the people's sin. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. In other words, if a sin is committed, the only appropriate reaction, appropriate judgment for that sin is death. For years, for generations, lambs died in the place of the people. They took on the punishment, the judgment so that the people would not have to. Now, according to Hebrews chapter 10, the repetition of this sacrifice, the constant need for a new sacrifice, was always pointing to a lamb that would one day be slain, that would one day settle the matter forever. The lamb whose blood would permanently pay our sin debt. Now, understanding that backdrop a little bit, let's go back to Luke chapter 22. We're going to read verses 14 through 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. End quote. Something I want you to see here is that in this Passover, in this establishing of communion, we see that Jesus Christ is the sacrificer and the sacrifice. He is the sacrificer and the sacrifice. So listen, Jesus knew exactly how this day was going to go. He had it planned since the foundations of the world. In verse 15, he had told his followers that he wanted to do this before he suffers. Now understand, to say, I want to do this before I suffer, means he knows what's coming because he planned it. He is the one making the sacrifice. 
He is the sacrificer. Yet, he is also the sacrifice itself. You see the new covenant spoken of in verse 20. It still demands a sacrifice. Reflecting the unblemished lamb, this sacrifice has to be unblemished. In other words, that means it has to be without sin. The people of Israel were helpless to overthrow those who had enslaved them. They were heartbroken over their oppression, yet they had no power to change it. Listen, we are the same with our enemies of sin and death. We are heartbroken. We are oppressed. We are helpless. We are in need of salvation. We have no way to make the dead alive. We need someone outside of us to do that which we cannot accomplish, to bring us to life. Jesus is the permanent sacrifice, the one that is good for all of time. Hebrews 10, 12 says, quote, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, end quote. So when we gather for communion or the Lord's Supper, We are not gathering like they did for the Passover when they had to make a new sacrifice. We are gathering to celebrate our for-all-time sacrifice, meaning we celebrate that our relationship with God can be secured, is secured, that our God has freed us from sin and death just as He freed the people of Israel from captivity in Egypt. We celebrate this, that there is nothing we have to bring to the table, that Christ Himself has completely done everything necessary. Jesus told us, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And again, this is going to take us back to the book of Exodus. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verses 26 and 27, quote, and when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Throughout the Old Testament, God calls his people to look back to how they were delivered out of Egypt by God. They were told to remember how God had been faithful, how God had saved them. They were supposed to be continually looking back at what God had done, how he had defeated the enemy they could not defeat. It was when God's people forgot about God's faithfulness and the power he displayed to save them. That is when they rebelled against God. Rebellion against God is rooted in failing to trust him. For us today, we must continually look back at God's goodness and faithfulness that he has proven on the cross. So that when sickness or joblessness or loneliness or the frustrations of life hit, we don't jump ship. We can look back to the cross where he has proven his love for us and know that even though I don't understand what he is doing now, I know that since he was faithful enough and loved me enough to go to the cross, then he is faithful enough to get me through this situation and that he will work through this storm to bring good. I may not like how he does it. I may not like when he does it, but I know he will do it. It will be for my ultimate good and most importantly, for the glory of his name. In this passage, Jesus is calling us to look back to how we were delivered out of death. Communion is remembering the goodness and faithfulness of God as he proved it on the cross by providing a once and for all perfect sacrifice to cover our sins. Communion is a declaration that echoes the words of Jesus when he says, it is finished. And that phrase in the Greek is tetelestai. And tetelestai was this accounting term that really meant paid in full. So when we look to the communion table, we look to something that Christ has paid for us in full. Communion also requires us to consider our relationships as well. It's not only about the vertical relationship of us and God, but the horizontal relationships between us and those who are around us. Now, this is going to be a fact that Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 32. Quote, Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. End quote. That whole why many of you are weak and ill and some have died thing sounds pretty serious, right? That is a serious warning for us to evaluate and discern. The context the passage is found in gives us a lot of information as to what it means. The context is that there are some really wealthy people in the church at Corinth, and they are gathering together. They're calling this communion, but really what they're doing is just feasting. And while they are feasting, they are forgetting some people on the invite list. They are leaving out the poor of the church, so only the wealthy are feasting. The wealthy in the church are treating the poor people in the church like they think they deserve to be treated. Notice I said not as they deserve to be treated, but as they think they deserve. Paul is telling them to think about what they're doing. When we take part in communion, we are proclaiming Jesus. The message of Jesus is that you are saved by the grace of God. You did not get what you deserved. You got what Jesus deserved, and he got what you deserved. A worthy manner to approach the communion table is one where we recognize the grace that we have been given, and we seek to give that grace to other people. We understand that God has delighted in showing us mercy, so let us delight in showing mercy to other people. To help us think about this, I wanted to remind you of a parable that Jesus told. He said there was a king that was collecting all the money his servants owed him. One servant in particular had racked up a pretty serious bill. He owed a lot of money. It says 10,000 talents which would really be what a laborer could earn in about 200,000 years. Who knows what he bought? Queso found, probably. I don't know. But today, that would be worth billions of dollars. Obviously, way more than the servant could pay back. But the servant, he pleaded for forgiveness, and the king forgave him every penny. So what does this forgiven servant do? Does he go and celebrate the grace that's been shown to him? No. He turns around and he starts choking this dude out who owed him money. And since the guy couldn't pay him, he has him thrown into prison. How much money was this forgiven servant owed? A hundred denarii, which comes out to, yeah, several thousand dollars. Now listen, several thousand dollars is a considerable sum of money. But what is a few thousand compared to several billion? It's nothing. The forgiven servant failed to see what he had been forgiven of and how much that debt was greater than what he was actually owed. Really, he could only look at what he thought the other man deserved. He was not discerning. He was not remembering what the king had done for him. He was acting in an unworthy manner. So whatever is between you and someone else, let it be settled. Discern the body. As we approach the communion table, Let us consider those who are in this body of believers. Are we treating them in light of what Jesus has done for us? Are we treating them as Jesus has treated us? Or are we like this forgiven servant who just wants to settle a score? There's also another side of this. You may be in the place where you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you have wronged someone. You know you have. You know you have sinned against them, however that might be. If you know your brother or sister has something against you, communion is an opportunity to go and to seek forgiveness. We do this in remembrance of Jesus. We apply the gospel to our relationships. We cannot treat others like we think they deserve, for God has not treated us as we do deserve. He has chosen us to treat us as Christ deserves and to treat Christ on the cross as we deserved. So so let us consider all the offenses towards us to be nailed to the cross of Christ. And let us then show the grace of Christ to those who have offended. I would also like to point out that this is all done in the context of a church body. Not that it has to happen in a church building, because it definitely doesn't. But it does have to be done by believers. And if you think about it, it only makes sense for people who are believers, who have experienced the grace of God, to be doing something that is set to remember the grace of God. Communion is an ordinance that Christ has established. 
It was built upon the Passover to help us remember what Christ has done for us, how He, the sacrificer, has made the ultimate sacrifice for us that goes for all time. For all time, our debt is settled for those who are in Christ. Communion gives us this beautiful opportunity to remember and to celebrate what He has done for us, the love that He has proven for us. And it also gives us the opportunity to evaluate whether we are treating our brothers and sisters in a way that reflects the grace we've been shown. There's surely more to discuss when it comes to communion. But I hope through this, maybe the next time you partake in the Lord's Supper, it will mean just a little bit more. Thanks for listening to the Steadfast Podcast. I want to remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Paul wrote this, quote, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, end quote. So in light of biblical truth, let us be steadfast, immovable. Let us remember that through Jesus, not one labor is in vain, not one trial is in vain, not one effort in all of our lives is in vain. Because He gives purpose. And that purpose rings through eternity. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget, if you've got questions you would like answered, you can email me at matt at steadfastpodcast.com.